show what works. Here, I'm going to steal my book back. If you haven't looked at this book, which I'm loaning out already, you should take a look at it. This is uh, in part what uh, Joe will be talking about today. I think that's the Russian River, is that right? That is the Russian River. This was a write-up that was, I thought, this is the best job ever. He's in a cataract. <laughs> He'll describe what he's doing, right? We can talk about this. Yeah. I thought, what a great idea to be able to see what's going on as you do on, on streets with Google uh, from a raft. And uh, so anyway, if anybody's looking for interesting careers, <laughs> talk to <laughs> about that. <laughs> that would really be fun. Joe is president of Freshwater Trust, a conservation nonprofit, which is headquartered in Portland. How many have heard of the Freshwater Trust? And you've been doing that for what, 15 years, 10 years? You know, it's, uh, it's like 16 or 17 years. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, he works on restoring rivers and other environmental issues. Now I've got the little list. With situational awareness, bold outcomes, innovation and technology, data and analytics, and game-focused investment. And he'll talk about that, I think. He calls this quantified conservation in his book, Quantified, which is near and dear. I think mostly you're gonna do a calculus talk yeah, today. Yeah, a lot of math today. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Redefining conservation for the next economy. A lot of what he's talking about is how to rethink how we approach getting the environmental outcomes we're looking for uh, more broadly. Uh, let's see, he has advised B Corp, and he's actually about to spin one up, is that uh, correct? And foundations and governments. He's a patented inventor, and he serves as the founding board chair of the Council for Responsible Sport. And Joe holds a, uh, a BA from Dartmouth, and a JD from Lewis and Clark College, uh, so he's got a dorsal fin. <laughs> And with that, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, he's indicated an interest in maybe doing more with us, so listen to what he has to say, and then I'm interested in your feedback. What might we want to do with Joe from here on forward in terms of collaboratives? He's into a lot of new things. So Joe, there you are, Bob. And thank you guys for coming out. I guess every day down here is a nice day, so <laughs> you'll have another one tomorrow, right? Um, but anyway, uh, my name's Joe Whitworth. I do run the Freshwater Trust, and I'll give you a little bit of background on that in a second. I'll give you the, the real story behind this. Um, we honestly had zero interest in doing street views about rivers. This was an elaborate come on to Google uh, for us to get a hold of their computing power, to be honest. Like, what we were doing on this, we, did, we came down the Russian River, and ultimately, uh, we did bio transects every couple of miles, and the reason we were doing that was to understand sort of what beds was growing where, um, so that we could true up the models that we used uh, from whether satellites or LIDAR or whatnot. Uh, and what we found out was we were, our models were pretty good. Um, but really the game, uh, is, which is still ongoing with Google, was to, when we came on and said, this is the idea that we have, we want to do this down the Russian and start using this uh, to build out some of our analytics so we can more effectively x-ray nature, if you will. Um, and they said, that's pretty cool. And so now we're in the process. We went back, did all the homework, show them the street view, show how it trued up all of our, our models. And now we've come back and said, if you get, how cool do you guys think that is? Because we would like to do this in a lot of places and we would like to use your computing power. Uh, which, you know, bringing 30,000 computers to bear on a problem really, uh, shrinks the size of that problem while leaving all the complexity. Uh, so it was not actually to do this, and it was, it was, it was kind of a, it was an ordeal to put that thing on that raft. Why don't you point to it? I'm not sure everybody has. So this is, a, this is the, the, uh, the Street View machine. This has 16 super expensive lenses. So there was a little bit of, uh, it was a little scary. Because if that went in the water, they were like, you're not gonna get this wet, are you? More like, <laughs> no possible way to give it. First time we get it in the water, then they go whoop. And so we, so we had to re engineer the whole thing in real time. And the brushing was really low. Uh, this is one of the deeper stretches that we had. Um, and so we had to drag that sucker through all kinds of stuff. But it was a great, great experience. And now we're working with the Google Earth Engine to kind of figure out how do we uh, begin to do this in other places. It could be a great summer internship for you guys if you want to hear a little rugged. Um, and don't mind getting dirty. Um, and you promise not to get the machines wet, because I, I can't promise them that again, and now knowing what we've gone through. 
Um, but that's kind of the, the background of this. And it was, it is crazy, crazy to me that we're doing the things that we're doing. Because when I was starting out, I didn't have any intention of, you know, not only writing a book, but, you know, getting software patented or, you know, doing stuff like this. The world is changing pretty rapidly, and I think it's a super exciting world to, to be in. Um, but my world started, see if I can do this right, a long, long time ago um, in a place called, well, on Blackbird Creek um, in Missouri, which is north central part of the state. We were the first generation off the farm. My, my siblings were. And so we grew up with the confluence of the Illinois, Missouri, Mississippi River system in a little place called Wood River. And so we were the city slickers, right, in the family. This is a place, uh, you know, its claim to fame was it was where Lewis and Clark wintered the year before they took Head West because there were no people in Wood River, Illinois. There was literally nine, population was nine. It hasn't changed a lot since. Um, and they wanted to keep their men out of the whiskey and women of St. Louis so they would have people to go west with them in the spring. So every summer I would go up uh, up there and, you know, summers were, my dad was a carpenter, so we would be framing up houses and then for vacation, we would go buck hay for one grandpa or the other, right? And so when I was very young, uh, my grandpa Whitworth would, was the kind of guy who would work all day to unwind. He would go down and hoe this sort of 50 acres of soybeans down in the bottomland uh, uh, on Blackbird. And we would just sit there and hoe and hoe and hoe and hoe. And say grandpa stuff to me and I would be the little kid. And, and, you know, I guess, I mean, I now look back, one of the great things that I learned from the book um, was not the literature search, right? I already knew kind of, I mean, the, the book itself is really a, a recap of many of the things that I've been barking about for the previous, you know, six, seven, eight years. But what I figured out was why I do this, which was, I didn't know why. But what I figured out was, my grandpa used to say, no man has the right to take more from the land than the land can take. And you know, I'm five years old, he's my grandpa, I of course believe that. Um, he believed it too, honestly. Um, but in his way, he, he probably didn't have an eighth grade education. He understood though that, that he saw that commerce and stewardship, when they're working properly, actually work together. If he took care of the land, the land would take care of him, right? That's a, that's a common refrain you'll hear within the agricultural community. Um, and it's interesting to think about it now, knowing what I do. Um, he saw that the economy and the environment, the two most powerful forces on earth, when they're working properly together, really are in balance. And so I, let, I grew up you know, I came out of this small hometown, went off into the world, and the world tells me, you know, that's not right. You know, these, these two forces don't work together. In fact, one wins when the other one loses. Right? That's what the world tells me. And in fact, about 10 years after he died, despite my grandpa's stated intention of having this balance, all from, from headwaters to the mouth of, of the Blackbird, was, uh, was listed as impaired under the Clean Water Act. And that had a pretty profound effect on me. Um, and what, it, what I realized in examining that was like, this is a guy who wanted to do the right thing, but he was caught in a system that was broken. Because you're, you know, when, you, when you come up like that, you're either, either your grandpa is a liar or the system is broken. And so I, of course, don't think my grandpa was a liar. I think the system's broken. And so, strangely, I have, I thought I, I thought I was working on the environment. Truly, what I'm working on, what we're working on, what you're going to be working on is the economy, which is, I didn't see that coming. Um, I didn't see that coming even while I was writing the book. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's kind of an interesting thing. So, uh, the good news is, I'm not alone in thinking that this can work, and I'm not alone uh, in thinking that my grandpa did have it right. Now, a while back, I heard uh, a story about the Rogue River North. Every year, uh, the Rogue is filled with, with salmons swimming upstream to spawn. Salmons. But because factories were allowed to, uh, allowing warm water to run back into the river, the temperature was becoming too high for the salmon to survive. So to fix the problem, the town could have required the company to buy expensive 
Yes, and what the fathers what was saying. So President there was speaking about our first um, water quality journey, um, which is that's a long way from my grandpa's farm to the highest, you know, the highest office of the land. That was I personally got a super jolt out of that. I was really I was in the audience when he told that story. And you don't know how they make how they make you know what comes on the teleprompter. Um, it's kind of a black box. So the guys at USDA that we were working with had put it in, and we didn't know, they didn't know. The guys who helped write the speech didn't even know it was coming in there. So anyway, it was very cool for that to happen. Um, and it, it is, it's a great vote of confidence, but the reality is um, it's an exception, not the rule currently, right? That's where the remodeling, um, the restructuring of the systems that we currently have, that's, that's the work in front of us now. Um, so a little bit about the Freshwater Trust, I'm not, this is not going to be an advert for the organization, uh, but essentially we started out as a very typical uh, conservation group uh, in the early 1980s. Um, we were basically the original wild fish group in the Pacific Northwest. We listed several of the first uh, Pacific salmon under the Endangered Species Act, um, but then, you know, which does stop bad things from happening, right? But then we realized it wasn't uh, we needed to make some good things happen. So we started working with uh, landowners to uh, put water in the stream for the benefit of the stream. Uh, started uh, what's now known as the water trust model, uh, a basic transaction model. It's willing buyer, willing seller. Doesn't operate exactly like a market um, yet. I think someday we'll get there. Uh, but right now, it really is just a mitigation uh, program uh, that uses incentives, which is the start down the path we got to get a lot more. Um, and we realized there, I mean, we kind of shifted from stopping bad things, to making good things happen, to how do you make really big things happen on a scale uh, that matters, on a timeline that matters. And that's led us to technology. Um, and understanding with greater precision, when we spend our time and our money and our effort, what are we actually getting? Because not all restoration is created equal, and we have largely thrown money at the problem and this for a while now, right? And so we have changed because our world has changed, right? And it's going to keep on changing. For us, uh, what we really have focused in on is agriculture, right? The, the water and nexus. Because of the 1% that's available for human use on the planet, 70% uh, goes to, you know, growing crops and raising animals for our consumption, right? And since Food is going to stay a pretty big part of, you know, life on Earth, of course. Um, understanding with our ag partners how to how to make more happen profitably with less inputs has become mission critical. It takes about 1,320 gallons of water to uh, put dinner on the table in the United States each day, um, and. So what we've got to figure out is how do you feed a plant that is growing in about a billion a decade, right? We've got to double agricultural production, and we've got to do, by 2040, and we've got to do that in a way that doesn't sort of undercut uh, the very resources that allow us to do it in the first place. We are not off to a good start, exploring dead zones. Uh, we've got species that are not coming back. Uh, within 10 years, we're going to have folks, you know, one in four will be affected by drought. Um, California is great for you, of course. Um, and the punchline in all this is if we don't get in front of this issue in a really big hurry, it's going to be our undoing, right? And it's coming a lot bigger and a lot faster than people understand. Uh, and so that's sort of bad news. Um, I'm not a doom and gloomer. Uh, I think that, that chapter's certainly been covered within the modern environmental era. I think we're good on that, everybody gets that, um, and we've maxed out. So how do we not do what we've been doing? How do we get more? Like we're, we are 45, 46 years into the modern environmental era um, of our nation's 3.7 million stream miles, 55% are impaired under the Clean Water Act. We are maxed, and we've got to, we gotta shift gears, right? We gotta stop worrying about process, because you can manage process now with software architecture in a way that we couldn't before, right? We can remove red tape, and that's not meaning, that doesn't mean that we, we need a shortcut, but the environment does. 
Um, and so technology, right? Science and technology are advancing into our lives every day, of course, um, and transforming entire sectors overnight. Water, there's been a whole lot, right? You know, if, you, if you've ever, <laughs> this kind of stuff happens on thousands and thousands and thousands of farms every single summer day. In California, it happens almost every single day, right? We can do a lot better. Technology's already here, right? The future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed. We now have you know, uh, smarter ways to irrigate. We can use real-time information to decide when to water, where to water, how much to water, when to use fertilizer, when not to use fertilizer, and we can see things that we couldn't see before. So that's sort of good news. Um, and probably the most exciting stuff is we now can x-ray nature. This, you guys, this is not news to you guys, but it's big news to a lot of people, right? And with that, we can with great precision understand in the watershed where to do work and where not to do work, right? It's not all restoration is created equal, and we shouldn't do every restoration deal. Right? And just because you have the Girl Scouts out planting trees doesn't mean it's helping a single thing. Um, but it's not just tech, right? It's simple stuff, right? Simple stuff, like keeping your cows out of, the, out of the repairing plantings that you do that are working to cool the watershed, right? Um, that sometimes gets lost. This is, not, this is not a paper exercise. This is a people exercise, right? I, can make the argument pretty well that the environmental war has been fought and the Greens won. It's over. We won. The Greens won on paper. What we have to do now is draw a through line from those beautiful words on paper to what actually happens on the ground. Right? That is the big, and it's, it's very difficult. I mean, when you start moving into the, the physical world, making these things make sense is difficult, right? We have to find a way to get a landowner to say, yeah, I would like to do this with you, right? This is about him. He is the gatekeeper. The people that control the industry and the stream environment are guys like this. And so despite our now quarter century in doing water deals, um, purchasing excess irrigation water and putting it in the stream for the benefit of the stream, it's not enough. But what we do know now is what 21st century conservation really, really, really needs to look like. And top of the, top of the list is water needs to be um, priced by a market and managed as a piece of a portfolio that can provide value to the landowner rather than just a simple input into a low value thirsty crop, right? And we, we see that's coming. Uh, and technology is one of the big precursors to allow that, but it's definitely coming. Um, California is lining up on it right now. Um, we also see a need for everybody everywhere to have information about their watershed so that they can manage with you know, great precision. Right? So we can stop spending the billions of dollars a year and missing the, the problem. Um, and so these kinds of things are what are going to mark this century, which is going to be, which, I mean, the limits of this century are going to be defined by water. They're, they are, they will determine, how we manage that resource will determine how far we ultimately go. So, once you figure it all out, write a book, right? And, um, and as Bob mentioned, you know, what I did was I kind of looked, looked across kind of I started with our work, and I noticed that we had been growing like nuts uh, during a time when many other conservation groups were um, not growing. I mean, we, we, when I walked in the door, um, we were nine people, $700,000 operating budget. And today we're about 50 people and about $10 million in operating budget, and we're probably not stopping. Um, we're also trying to figure out how do you, how do we get users out into the field? We don't want to pick up every shovel. We need it to be picked up and used in a way that is uh, that gives us the greatest amount of environmental uplift for the least amount of cost. Right? Those are those are available to us. And I just want to check before I get into this. What time is this? We have three and a half hours, I think, right? We <laughs> <laughs> scheduled for one hour, so 11:30 to 12:30. Okay. And All right. I think Good. that clock is roughly right. Okay. Yeah, I just want to just want to say I definitely covered three and a half hours. It's like the room would get a lot hotter. 
So, so anyway, what I did in looking at, kind of, I tried to distill what it was that made our work work uh, and us grow. And we had gotten to the place, uh, there were a couple of disillusioning moments um, in my career. Uh, you, know, if you, you know, what you learn in about 18 months is that if you move to Portland, Oregon, or honestly, almost anywhere else, and you put a logo um, by your name, and you're willing to raise a million dollars in $2,500 increments, you too can run a conservation group in the United States. <laughs> um, and it's a horrible existence. I mean, it will tear you up getting on that hamster wheel. And we had uh, several opportunities to get <laughs> some reminders of how it was working, how it was not working. And um, one of those was when we were working with a landowner to fix a single mile of stream. And it was going to take us about a week of uh, dirt work to do that project. It took us three years in permitting and uh, funding cycles in order to get the permission and the dollars together to do that one week of work, which honestly was moving pretty swiftly through the system. Um, yeah, I know, right? Um, and what it jarred in me was wow, if we're moving through the system at that rate, how soon until we get this done, right? Um, kind of big, dumb question, which I sort of specialize in. Uh, and what I found out was in the state of Oregon, which is a very typical state uh, in terms of its water management, we had uh, we have 115,000 stream miles, and uh, 80,000 of those stream miles need some sort of redress. Everybody in conservation, my own group, and every other conservation group and every other public agency, everybody playing in this game, we were completing about, this is a very generous estimate, uh, we were completing about 600 to 700 projects a year. Not all of those projects averaged a mile in benefit, but if they did, 700 to 80,000 people, I should go flip burgers for a living, right? What I'm doing and what this entire sector is doing approaches zero in terms of environmental benefit. And that is a horrible thing to kind of come to realize, right? And then that's when I started, well, what are we all trying to do? That's when we figured out there are only 16 ways to fix a river, right? That's it. And so the billions of dollars that are going into this and the tens of thousands of people that are involved in this, we're chasing a really small outcome, a really small set of outcomes. Like it's really its form and function of these to let them actually operate uh, the way that they were born to operate, right? And so it was pretty interesting. We had, um, so that was obviously, you know, a big, a big hitter in terms of situational awareness, right? So then we looked across all of these. These are, these are the 303 delisted streams in the United States, 55% of 3.7 million miles. That is after an entire generation of modern environmental effort. We're maxed. We will never get better than this if all we use is the tools that got us here. Which is not to say, and I got, I get, I got, I got completely gobsmacked by several of my environmental colleagues. They're like, are you saying that my life's work is useless? Are you saying that I'm lazy? Are you saying that I'm no? And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm saying we're at the top of the list. And what we said we wanted to do, we are no longer on track to do it. We had unbelievable great start, right? Innovative, all kinds of great stuff, but we have kind of maxed. And so the situational awareness idea in the book, I kind of looked through um, kind of the history of when, you know, when this was working. It was popularized, it's a military term, like how to keep track of things in a highly dynamic environment. It's an aviator term, right? So situation's changing rapidly, you've got to make some moves. If you don't make moves, you're going to crash the plane. Andy Grove, one of the first uh, CEOs of Intel, uh, approximated this to business. He said, look, you know, when you start out, you're, you're brand new, you're, you're creating these things, and then as you become successful, you begin to get comfortable in that success. And a lot of times, if you do not understand the world around you changes, or is changing, then you're going to keep on doing what you used to do, and you will become relevant, right? So very 
easy example in the business sector. Who in the room, who in the room has a phone? That's right, you all have phones, right? <laughs> who in the room has a Blackberry? <laughs> Anybody got a Blackberry? They lack situational awareness. And Apple and Android handed it to me, right? Classic example, it happens all the time. And so what we have to do, I mean, in the environmental world, you know, back in 19, so off the coast of Santa Barbara, right? Whenever, you know, the Goel spill in 68 or um, the Cuyahoga River was on fire, right? That's an obvious one. Everybody got it, right? If you look at any successful social movement, you know, the environment, votes for women, civil rights, whatever it was, is somebody raised their hand and said, hey, man, this is a problem. Did you guys know this was going on? And everybody goes, wow, that is a problem. We should do something, right? And so, we did that once really well. And it led to a, just a cascade of innovation. Like we made up all those laws literally out of thin air. Nobody had ever done it in the world, right? And the environmental movement was very much driving that. Um, and with the force, the political force of people saying, yeah, we should do it. It's very, you know, the, the groundwater laws that were passed in 2014, same thing. This is rock home. We should do something about it. Yeah, let's do that, right? Um, so sometimes it's easy, but agriculture was exempted from the Clean Water Act, Lord. There aren't regulators. Um, and so how do we, even though we don't see those rivers burning anymore, they're still kind of on fire, right? And we've got to figure out a new way to get a hold of that. So first thing, know you got a problem. Situational awareness, right? Know you got to change something. Know that what your solution, what you've been doing, isn't as effective as it used to be. You know, laws and diminishing terms. There are a lot of different. Um, there are a lot of different cues that we can see, and a lot of times we can feel them intuitively. And in fact, we have done that quite a bit. But right now, we just did as we're looking to spin off uh, this for-profit entity. We were looking at kind of how the world really. The rules around water were set up in a world of assumed steady state. Like, and if all you do is look backward in time and see, you know, kind of how much water we did have and how those allotments were made and how agriculture has always been there for us, right? And how uh, all the, the infrastructure that we have in places like Flint or even in the Portland Public Schools, how it's always been able to deliver. Right? If you look backward, it looks like a pretty boring world, right? If you look forward, I mean, if you look at sort of the trends that are going, like the demographics of farmers, the way uh, land is not leveraged, meaning you know ownership and operators are still the same people. Um, if you look at the need for ag production to double in you know 20 years, uh, and if you look at deferred maintenance and infrastructure and what's happening, if you look at climate disruption and what's going to be happening already starting to happen. If you look forward into the future, this thing takes off, right? In about 2010, all of those steady state pieces really started creeping up into an inflection point. Kind of, we hadn't ever looked at it, but we've got this really cool graph that shows it. And what we want to do is get out in front of it. And we did a lot, we were small, we were a small enough group that we could kind of feel the change was happening. In fact, we really turned, we pivoted to Technology um, in Iraq, we started around 20, 20 and 7 when we really started looking at um, accelerating the pace and scale of restoration just using technology so we could translate across those 16 outcomes and all the different colors of money and all the procedural steps. We kind of built TurboTax for restoration using basic software. Um, and that, that enabled us to kind of move forward, but we only did it intuitively. But these are knowable if you really start paying attention. So situational awareness, first time. Second thing, outcomes, big outcomes. The world is sort of this, uh, we live in a very politically safe, well, I won't say that. Um, anyway, this is back before I was you know, faced with this current election cycle, but we live in a world where we kind of patch and tinker, right? Everybody wants to do a pilot project. Everybody wants to do a little bit of something. Everybody wants to try to just inch their way forward. And I'm telling you, if you I need another pilot project like I need a hole in the head. And that's true of you too. 
Don't ever do a pilot project in your life. Just go do it, right? We don't have to test it. We know what we gotta do. We gotta get after it. And so this, this law of 10X was something that was um, popularized recently by uh, Larry Page, the founder of Google, one of the founders of Google. And basically his, his idea is if you ask people to, engage, to find a 1,000% solution they will begin to refine, redefine the entire terms of the problem. They will ask fundamentally new questions, right? And so if you push yourself for a 1,000% improvement instead of a 0% improvement, you're gonna get a much different solution, like, or even a 10% or 20%. But here was what was striking to me in all of this. In law school, second year law school, they teach you how to win environmental lawsuits. There is a set of procedures, procedural steps that must be hit along the way. And the agencies are largely underfunded, they're, they're understaffed, and if you take the time, you will find where they miss their step. And once you do that, you got it. And that's what we do. That is our core competency as a movement. That is the top thing that we have been able to do with great success, right? So if you think of that, that's a hold the line position. That's a 0% improvement, right? Now it would have been sweet at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. If we could have done it then, that would have been great. But we didn't do it then. And so we, gotta, we, gotta, we need massive improvements. So what these two things, once you have, once you say we have a problem, and then we say, you know what? Here's what we're gonna do. We're not gonna do a pilot project. We're gonna fix the dead zone in the Gulf. We're gonna make sure that Colorado makes it to the ocean. Not the Will Ferrell, Robert Redford, you know, million gallons. We do nine million gallons in small trips every single year. A million gallons in the Colorado River? Please, that's, that's PR bet. That's not a real bet. And so we have to say we're gonna do those big things. And what you do when you, when you have, when you know you got an issue, and you know what your outcome's gotta be, you have a design question on your hands, right? Then you can get into system design, right? What are the parameters of what I'm working with and where am I gonna go? Right? It's kind of like the, um, have you ever seen the movie Apollo 13? So Ed, the actor Ed Harris was just for NASA, and he comes in, the guys are gonna die because they're gonna run out of oxygen up there, and he comes running in, he says, look, here's 64 parts, you know, this, you have, you have this square thing that has to convert to a round thing. You have 38 minutes, failure is not an option, go. That is a design question, right? And it's timeline. But what you're gonna do, those guys didn't pick it up and start putting it back the way it was originally designed. They discarded some parts. They used new parts, right? They used what they had and they redesigned it. That's innovation, right? And innovation isn't just, it's not super tech. Tech is awesome, it's great, but I'm not, I'm not the, the technophile that says, oh, it's gonna save us. I think it's a, it's a beginning step. Innovation can also be, you know, how do you do a water transaction with a landowner that would, has been told for generations at his grandparents' knee, don't you ever give your water up, no matter what happens. Don't ever, ever, ever do that. Figuring out how to do that, that was a freaking innovation. And it's hard, we call it a 300 cups of coffee transaction. Um, <laughs> but it's those simple things. Remember, this is a people exercise. I mean, technology alone can't fix this. This ultimately has to translate into the physical world. Otherwise, we've got nothing. So that innovation is key. And it's, you know, it's really, we started seeing it, you know, when we started getting into the data game and the analytics game. I didn't understand what big data was until very recently. Um, totally enamored by it now, I'm a huge believer. Um, but what you can do now is track what you've been, you know, what you have to do, where you started from and where you're going, right? We can, we can find out um, whether or not these innovations can really work, right? We don't have to kind of, we don't have to have this theoretical piece. We can get going and we can track and we can change. Adaptive management, right, it's kind of, it's, it's the, the most recent um, generations, it's their multiple use, right? 
Adaptive management from knowing phase for monitoring, guess what? You're not really adapting because you don't really know where you are in space and time. Um, and so what they use it as, in my opinion, you get into a difficult decision-making process and you're like, oh, yeah, let's, we're not gonna really, you know, uh, extract all of the trees. What we'll do is we'll just manage it for a while and we'll see what's happening and then we'll adjust from there. But the problem is, the underfunded agencies and the underfunded NGOs kind of get through that decision point and nobody pays for monitoring and the only people who are at the table are the captured agencies and those folks that are gonna benefit by use, the overuse of the resource, pick your resource. Um, and so adaptive management has allowed for many tight decisions to go forward with a nice little smiley face on it, but nobody's paying for monitoring, right? So that's crazy, that's crazy. Uh, we have got to track it. And I, I will caveat that last crazy piece by saying it, it's, we've gotten a lot better the ability to use these analytics. I mean, data, just remote sensing, there are a lot of things that I, literally in the last couple of years have accelerated in a way that gives us great hope that we can do a lot more monitoring remotely, right? Those, that, um, that map of red lines, the 303D map um, I showed a little bit earlier, that took um, the United States 12 years to make. 12 years it took us to put that map together. And that's really weird now to take 12 years to do anything. We, every 90 minutes, 13,000 satellites circle the Earth, <coughs> most of which with the capacity to send high resolution photos back to Earth to give ourselves real-time information to truly adapt it and manage, right? We can't wait for 12 years anymore on anything. I can't even wait for my kid to grow up and be 12 years old, right? That's, that's too long. You need to be 12 by the time you're 10, right? There's got to be, we, we can do things faster now. Um, so the data and analytics allow us to do things where before we couldn't. Um, we're working on a project in um, Snake River Basin. We're working with a client, a utility, that is in charge of the entire phosphorus, sediment, and temperature load in the whole Snake River Basin, right? So what we did was we have sorted through 39 million acres to find the 5,000 acres that we're gonna need to completely deal with the phosphorus issue, right? And one of the big innovations that is converted into data um, is a lingua franca between the economy and the environment. And this is where the, the unsexy name quantified came from. I didn't want it to be called quantified as a big fight with the publisher. I don't men, recommend necessarily writing a book. There's a lot about it that you think is gonna be cool and it ends up being a total shadow. Um, but we've all heard about It's been, the, it's, been the, it's been the great white buffalo. You know, certainly since I've been doing this. Um, and the way it's working, it's getting a lot better now, but for years and years, we had this kind of interesting phenomenon, this interesting dynamic in the discussion where you had um, the Greens are like, it's gonna be great, man. We're gonna harness capitalism for the good of the environment. Um, and the money is saying, yeah, well, okay. I, I, if I put my money in and get it back out and do the right thing, that sounds good to me. The problem is the money doesn't really understand the environment and the Greens don't understand money, right? It's been a big, 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 big disconnect. You know, that's why everybody here should take an accounting class before you're out of here, right? Take an accounting class. And I'm not talking, I mean, not an environmental accounting class, an accounting class. Uh, just you need to be able to understand how a balance sheet works you need to be able to understand how the money works. Uh, it's really important, you don't have to know it deeply, but you do have to be aware of it. Being a conservationist in the 21st century is not about smoking weed and reading John Muir. And it was like that not so long ago, right? <laughs> this is about getting stuff done in the real world, right? And it can happen, but these tools are new and you have to really be able to work with all of them, right? Because this is going to be a super applied era. 
everything's got to work. And again, there's a lot here, and it's brand new. I mean, the cool thing is you're on the front end of what I will, what I think is going to be, it'll be the next great era within conservation, right? I mean, I really do believe that. And I don't even fully understand all these variables that are coming online. I did my best in trying to bring them to make sense of them in the book so that they can be used. You guys are going to take my stuff and you're going to look back in 10 years and go like, that was, that was like kindergarten grade reading. That was like small child thinking. You're going to do some unbelievable things, things that I can't even fathom. Um, but I do believe we are in this era straight point. Um, and I'll get back to that in a second. The thing that Obama was talking about was this, uh, this project that we did on the Rogue River in Oregon was one of the first wild and scenic rivers. Uh, designated the first eight or nine, I think they did that in 68. Um, and essentially, um, in q and if we have some time left, somebody asked me about the wild and scenic rivers. Some of you remember that. Um, but the, the thing that we did was we were not impressed with all, I mean, ecosystem service, ecosystem service marks, white paper rich environment. And we've been deal guys, we've been doing water deals. Um, we're trying to get things going. And so we're just like, okay, who's paying? Who's buying them? What are they getting? And how do they know they're getting? And what we came up with was a, uh, an environmental accounting system. We knew that under the Clean Water Act, which many of you do know, that anything that goes down the drain has to be treated, right? In that treating process, it generally gets warmed up. And under the Clean Water Act, temperatures are polluted, especially in salmon country, right? Cold water during times of migration are really important. And so which, what they had to do, this town of Medford, about 100,000 people, um, what they had to do was figure out a way to offset or take care of their thermal load. Their thermal load was in a unit of a kilocalorie, 300 million kilocalories per day was what they were, that was what their permit required them to do. And permits under the Clean Water Act, the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, NPDES, basically are written by chapter books and, you know, different constituency of the different chapters. So chemical constituents you can't really deal with, uh, you're going to have to deal with a filter, but temperature you can deal with uh, biologically, right? We can cool a watershed, right? We can do it now in a quantified way. We know that on certain slopes on the south side of the river, you don't, we don't do any, we don't do any temperature projects on the north slope because it doesn't, it doesn't have the exposure that we need. But if you plant 1,900 native stems per acre on a certain slope in a certain place, you can get a specified number of kilocalories. So what they were going to do was essentially, <laughs> their game plan was, we're gonna dig a humongous hole about 100 feet deep and we're gonna, after the water's treated, we're gonna pump it into the hole, we're gonna wait for a couple of weeks and then we're gonna pump it out. And we're gonna own all the capital costs, we're gonna own all of the, uh, the operating costs and it was gonna cost them about 20 million bucks to do this, right? This was their best option. They thought they were really thinking through. Then we started a discussion around this lingua franca being a kilocalorie. It doesn't matter how it's built, it's what it does, right? So we can build you those same kilocalories for a fraction of the cost, right? So we went out and we built them. Again, we sorted through three million acres to find the, give or take, 200 acres that were high uplift sites that would give us 600 million kilocalories per day, right? At a cost of six and a half million dollars to those guys. So they're in compliance and it costs them less money. We did no evangelizing at all. We didn't have to talk to them about the right thing to do for the environment, or if the fish are important, don't you care about it. We didn't do any of that crap, right? It's like, you're in compliance, you're saving money. Boom. They're like, great. Because you got to remember, these city councils, wait, wait, before I say this, do I have any city councilors in there? <laughs> no. These guys, like, they run the auto parts store, right? You know, they don't know anything about this, and they honestly don't care. I'm, of course, cartooning a little bit. The reality is, if they, their, their calculus needs to be simplified so that they can make a good decision. Now, on the environmental side of the ledger, look at what we got, right? We have those trees that are planted, 
Um, we're of course only calculate, accounting for and selling, if you will, uh, the temperature benefit of the kilocalories that are coming off this. Because we can quantify the shade that comes in and we can cool the watershed by doing that. But those trees are also stabilizing bank. Sediment's not going to get into those waters. We can quantify that. Sequestering carbon, we can quantify that. Uptake of nutrients, we can quantify that. Providing wildlife habitat, we don't really quantify that, to be honest, but it's a good thing. Um, but we got like an environmental three for or four for. And guess what? The nonprofit business model, which you know, which you're gonna learn in your accounting class, is the nonprofit business model is cost minus 20%. Right? That means you gotta go out and sort of whiten out the fundraiser, right, to make your payroll. In this deal, we are clearing eh, somewhere between a million and a half to two million dollars. And we have a 20-year monitoring and maintenance budget, which is unheard in the business, unheard of in this sector. And that allows us to take that earned revenue and we can fill that back into, in this case, we're using it in this very basic, go out and purchase, egg, purchase irrigation water. And we're doing some large woody debris. So we can, in a very short period of time, get the greatest biological response to recover some of those fish in that basin. And we are, we are well ahead of schedule. I mean, we are, the, the planning sites are doing so well that we're actually going to have to hire a forester to come in and thin out all of our planning sites, which is cool. Um, we're also compensating landowners. It's a simple land lease, anywhere from two to 800 bucks an acre a year for those 20 years in order to do this work. Basically, they're being paid to grow bushes of nature. We don't want to talk to landowners about doing conservation. They're like, oh, I'm going to get conservation. Can you grow some bushels of nature? <coughs> yeah, you want me to grow some? I can totally grow it. We'll grow that. Um, and it just sort of flips it. So they're getting paid for shade. They're growing a bushel of nature. Um, we're putting people to work. I mean, people are buying equipment. We've got sort of an industrial restoration economy starting to develop now. Um, and so those are the kind of things that you can do if you have these equivalencies, right? It's not, it's not what it is, it's what it does. And you've got to be, you have to have these, these equivalencies in order to do that. So these two great forces can actually speak to one another appropriately. That's kind of, that, developing the, the standardized set of legal, biological and transactional mechanics. So the first deal is like the 500th deal, it's like the 5,000th deal. That's what this is all about. I mean, that's what the big piece in front of folks that are doing work, people that are trying to get involved in conservation finance, that's what it's gonna be all about. And so, let's see. Red lines blue, this is how you do it. Let's see how this thing ends. Oh, it ends with a cone. <laughs> um, stop. So, take a couple of questions, but I want to say one thing. The, one of the coolest things that I got to come across was um, this guy, Jim Dunard. Anybody here? Jim Dunard? Jim Dunard founded Oakley. When Jim Dunard was a little boy, he was a motocross rider, right? So he learned pretty early on that when he would get in these long motocross <laughs> races, he would get sweaty. And when he got sweaty, his grips got slippery. Right? And he goes, that stinks. I would like it to be if the sweater I got, the sweater my grips got, the grippier they got. That would be super great. And all of the grip makers and Honda and Kawasaki said, look, punk, that's not how that's not how this works. It can't be done. And yet he went out and did it. I don't know if anybody had has anybody had Oakley grips? You have to be maybe of a certain age. Anyway, it worked well. They were really cool, they were kind of rubbery. Um, but they got more gritty. And then you parlayed that into, you know, just sort of doing crazy innovation around uh, lending. Um, and so, but one of the things that he did, I mean, that's kind of a design system. One of the things that he said, which is my favorite quote, I actually ended the book in it with this quote. Oh, man, you know, there's a lot of good stuff before the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely go by the book. Uh, but, um, what he said was, everything in the world can and will be made better. The only questions are when and by whom. And I think right now, with us, with you guys, I mean, the only, the only answers 
to that question, that challenge is now and by us, right? And I, I'm actually more enthused today than I certainly was at any point since I started doing this. Uh, and I'm pretty excited about where you guys are gonna go uh, with it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there. We've got a couple of minutes uh, for some Q&A. And so if you've got anything, Yeah, the delay, uh, the question is, uh, how does the timing work? Because uh, if I'll em embellish the question on, on the, the water quality trades that we did, uh, you know, the one nice thing about a grade structure is it's working from day one. You've got 300 million kilocalories of benefit day one, right? Whereas a tree, you got to plant and grow on. Right? It takes a while for that shade to come along. Um, it's based on modeling, right, as it is the permit. So, we are doing a 20 year event horizon that uh, you have far less than what you want on day one, but you have far more than what you need um, by the time you're in about year eight and continue on through that. Then you can never take those trees down. Um, there's, no, there's no backsliding clauses in the Clean Water Act. So if you make those gains, you can't strip those trees out and say, hey, I want to be able to do that again, right? You can't do that. Big consideration, but it's a little bit of a red herring. Um, and here's how this, these permits are structured. <clears throat> Under the Clean Water Act, uh, you have a situation where permits are based on um, population, right? And more than that, based on population projections. So here's, so they'll take a city, and they'll say, and every city thinks that they're going to grow up to be a big city. Like, um, and they mostly don't, but everybody takes those populations uh, estimates from 10 years from now. And then the way the permit is drawn is you take all of the populations of all the cities on that waterway, and then you start there. That's your, your, your beginning point. You, and then you take the hottest two-week period, like it's 10 days, in that watershed. And each of those population estimates are going full bore. Like just the effluents are coming out at the maximum every day for those 10 days in the hottest 10 day period. This is in the, temp the temperature setting. And they take all of that and then they double that, right? And as a practical matter, it's never going to do that, right? Uh, and so what, you, what you're looking at is really, okay, if, we, if that's the, the, that's, and then they sort of prorate out, you know, this city has 20% of the population, 20% of those, these guys have seven, they have seven, whatever, and you do it like that. And so, for us, in looking at this, because we're a conservation group, right, we're not a markets group, um, what we looked at is, there are certain certain cases where you cannot do that. Like, if you had full-on fish, if you had a, a really hot effluent there, you really want to fish. I mean, there's, a, there's some thermal fluid that would stop migration, you can't do it. Sometimes you can't do that. In fact, we looked at how we could do that. And so what we did was look at, you know, what's the real benefit here? And for us, just having that plant, just having that big hole in the ground, yeah, it stopped that 300 million kilocalories a day, but if you really do the analysis and you look at what, you're, what we're getting, uh, it's, a, it's an environmental winner going away. And I think we even, we even plussed up a lot of our, you know, a lot of what we want. So, so we did that by, by going not 300 million kilocalories a day, but 600 million kilocalories per day. We even doubled that. And so, you know, that's kind of a, it's been a stumbling block um, within the conservation community. This, that question always comes up. And so, you know, for us, one of the hurdles has been having people really understand kind of how the permits are drawn up. And, you know, we, want, we, we don't want to do a deal where the environment loses ground. And honestly, we don't want to do a deal where the environment even holds its ground at this point. So that was kind of for our for our purposes, you know, making that bet, making that deal, having 20 years where a landowner get to derive value from growing a bushel of nature, we'll make that trade now. You know, so it's but it is it's an important consideration. It doesn't work everywhere every time. So you have to do you have to do the analysis. So other questions? Yeah. Uh, I appreciate what you said about don't do a pilot project, and that would be certainly the best case scenario. But I'm wondering if you have any recommendations about how to prove a concept.
concept that hasn't been proven yet without a pilot project? Yeah, try it. I mean, nobody wants to take risk. Like th that first deal um, with the city of Medford, nobody wanted to take that risk. The regulators didn't want to take the risk. The cities didn't want to take the risk. And we said, screw it. You know what? If you're out of compliance, we will step into that breach with you. We will pay your $25,000 per day violation. And, you know, of course, that gives you a belt and suspenders out there for parity. Very conservative in how we did our models to make sure that we were going to get the growth on the timeline that we needed uh, without the, the, the failure rates. And so I think we're at a place where, you know, I think what we see is a lot of, a lot of people that are starting to experiment with new concepts and new constructs. And you have, if, if those synapses don't quite match, and that's what pilot projects do, they build like this little tentative bridge across those things. And sometimes you just have to step into that breach and take the risk. And so, Finding the money is gonna be hard. You know, finding people to do the work on speculation is hard. Um, but the, the and, and to date, many of these, even the worn path for this work, every restoration project has, is a little bit of a miracle. And so, you know, the proof of concept is important, um, but we've gotta do, we, we have so many, I mean, one of the things in the book, like there are so many good little examples out there. And they're all over the place. The problem is, it's just, I mean, like I said, the, the future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed. And we have to find a way that can show a path forward. And that's where the proof of concept is just, that's a rope across the bridge. Like, we've got to build more sturdy pathways across. So I think, you know, of course you're gonna do pilots, and of course you're gonna do proof of concepts, but don't think that's it. Don't think it stops there. You've got to build little things that somehow manifest big ideas. They don't matter, right? I mean, I'm still waiting for my own organization to do something that matters, right? And we're going to, but it's got to be, it's got to be big. You always have to have your eye on that prize. So don't let yourself off the hook by saying, oh, sweet pilot project, we paid for ourselves for a year and a half. Don't let you, because that's, we have the problems are too big, so go big. We're out of time. Let's take one, let's take one last question, and then uh, for those of you who went to our Kuros class, uh, you're going to have another uh, bite at the apple here with questions. Is that right? Yes. So, uh, but let's take one more, and then if, are you in our Kuros class? stuff, they can tear across the landscape and leave lots of problems behind. 
And markets are exactly the same. Markets are not the only answer here, not by a long shot. Um, I think outcome and quantification are the pieces that we have to get after. And whether it's kind of a market-driven concept, which is a big piece of it if we design it right, uh, but it's also about paying for performance. Like the USDA spends, what, six, eight billion dollars a year and they don't know what they're getting, right? And they can only tell EPA, hey man, we spent six or eight billion dollars to work with these many thousands of landowners and put these many acres under production. Those can be the wrong acres, right? And it may not get us any water quality benefits. So the discipline here is not the discipline of the market. The discipline is this quantification, quantified conservation, I hope, will in 10 years time, we'll just call it conservation, right? Or we'll just call it doing business, right? And I think that's, that's where we have to go. So that's where I'll leave it today. Thanks for coming in. It's, it's